In episode 59, we looked at early results coming from the James Webb Space Telescope. These results called sleepless nights for Big Bang theorists and panic among many astronomers. They were supposed to find a few stars just starting to form into primitive galaxies. The Firks galaxies were only supposed to be there about a billion years after the supposed Big Bang. There should definitely not have been disks and elliptical galaxies, which are supposed to take many billions of years to form. But the photos showed galaxies just like those they'd been photographing for years. There were many disks and ellipticals. Since then, ever more observations and analysis keep showing bigger and bigger problems for the Big Bang. That shouldn't come as a surprise. Way back in 1989, John Maddox noted in Nature that in all respects, save that of convenience, this view of the origin of the universe is thoroughly unsatisfactory. And in 1995, he pointed out that observations from the Hubble Space Telescope make nonsense of the Big Bang. Since then... One solid disproof after another has been observed, discussed, and ignored. A very few scientists, like Eric Lerner and Pierre-Marie Robitaille, have dared to point out serious reasons why the Big Bang must be rejected. Most scientists just shrugged their shoulders and accepted yet another ad hoc excuse and a bit more mathematical tinkering. The Big Bang seems to be anchored firmly into astronomers' thought processes. One of the big problems we saw in episode 59 was the size of the galaxies. Astronomers base everything on Einstein's general theory of relativity. That tells them that in an expanding universe, there would have been bending of light to give magnified images of far distant objects. So they scaled everything down to bring it back to normal. Or so they thought. But it gave them impossibly small and impossibly bright galaxies. Putting them back to the size they were without Einstein may solve these problems, but it's an admission that the universe is not expanding, as Eric Lerner and a few other renegades have been pointing out for years. And if it's not expanding, there can't have been a Big Bang at all. There have been requests in the channel for an update on James Webb. So let's start off with a few items from a 60 Minutes presentation which looks at some developments since episode 59. Well, we've discovered the most distant galaxy in the universe, the one that is the furthest away from us that we currently know about. Uh, and now this red splotch that you see there, that galaxy, that's a galaxy, that galaxy is more than 33 billion light years away. How long after the Big Bang? the beginning of the universe did this galaxy form. It's amazing, it's only 320 million years after the Big Bang. Brandt Robertson claims they know a lot about this embarrassing galaxy. So we can actually measure things like how fast it's forming stars, we can measure the amount of stars in the galaxy, we know the size because we know how far away it is, uh, and we know the typical age of the stars in the galaxy, so we know a lot. They actually know next to nothing. They have hypotheses based on guesses, and that's all. He says they know how quickly stars are forming. They do not. Nobody has ever seen a star forming. They have a hypothesis which says blue stars must be young, meaning less than two billion years old, and therefore they must have formed recently. He tells us the galaxy formed only 320 million years after the Big Bang. 
That's less than one third of the time the first galaxies are supposed to have taken to form. After 320 million years, this might, at a stretch, have allowed a few young blue stars. But there are many. So he claims the galaxy must be pumping out stars as fast as a hummingbird's heartbeat. It's like a hummingbird. You know, the heartbeat of this galaxy is so rapid. What do you mean by that? Well, this galaxy is forming stars at about the rate of the Milky Way, even though it's 100 times less massive. So it really is like a hummingbird. The heartbeat of this galaxy is racing. But that galaxy also contains many stars of different types and colors. The accepted theory requires many billions of years for them to form. They must have been there billions of years before the Big Bang, no matter how long it took those new, blue stars to appear. But he keeps quiet about them. Matt Mountain, the leader of James Webb's operations, makes a stunning admission about how much the astronomers really know about the cosmos. And whenever you hear the term dark energy or dark matter, this means we don't know what it is. We're not that imaginative. But it is a force. It is 95% of our universe. And we have no idea what it is. Wait a minute. 95% of our universe is made up of dark energy and dark matter, and we don't know what it is. Correct. We're lucky if we even understand 4% of our universe. He says they're lucky if they understand 4% of the universe. I think he's being very optimistic. Much of what they claim to know has been conclusively disproved. I seriously doubt if they understand 1%. Then Erica Nelson goes into raptures about another set of galaxies. They also wipe out the Big Bang. Astrophysicist Erica Nelson of the University of Colorado Boulder thinks her team may have made a discovery that she says would break the theory of how the early universe formed. Either this is wrong or this is a huge discovery. And we think that it's a huge discovery. So. Nelson is investigating what may be five giant galaxies that appear to have formed much too quickly after the Big Bang. If they're confirmed, astronomy may have to revise the timeline of galaxy formation. Is finding things that we didn't expect, that we can't explain, because that means that we have to revise our understanding of the universe. In saying, we'll have to revise our understanding of the universe, she's admitting They've got it all wrong. In several episodes, I've pointed out that the stunning pictures we see in astronomy books and websites are Photoshop masterpieces. Anyone looking through a telescope would not see anything like those pictures. They're produced by an electronic detector called a charge-coupled device attached to a telescope. It collects all sorts of signals for many hours while the telescope is kept pointing to the same spot in the sky. The data is sent to a computer with a program which interprets the data the way the programmer thinks appropriate. A Photoshop wizard adjusts the resulting image to his liking and lo and behold, you're looking at magnificent structures in the sky. This is what a web infrared picture looks like until they match the data-filled darkness to colors of wonder. You can see here just how much photoshopping is needed to get those impressive pictures. Well, in most of the experts' comments on the James Webb results, we're given the impression that the Big Bang could be saved by reinterpreting and pushing the time scale back a bit. In episode 59, I said that is exactly 
what we could expect. But things just got worse as more data came in. And deeper analysis just couldn't make things fit, even with lots of mathemagic. So now we have a situation I'd only expected in another year or two. Open admission that the universe did not start with a Big Bang. And admissions that nobody knows how it did start. The James Webb Telescope stands as humanity's grandest and mightiest space instrument ever deployed. Yet no one was expecting it would pose a challenge to the Big Bang theory. The telescope's recent observations are compelling astronomers to reconsider their understanding of the universe's origin. Renowned physicist Roger Penrose didn't hold back in describing the astonishing discoveries made by the JWST. The problem lies in the fact that the James Webb Space Telescope is disrupting the current understanding. Suddenly, we realize that we may need to revise all the textbooks that explain the beginning of the universe. So a crop of new proposals to replace the Big Bang are popping up. These ideas include many variations on a theme of black holes. Roger Penrose claimed that black holes are a robust prediction of general relativity. So, according to secular science, they definitely exist. But general relativity, as we saw in episode 44, is a mathematical story based on Minkowski's fairy tale dimension, imaginary time multiplied by the speed of light. So black holes are only a robust prediction in fairyland. Nobody has actually seen one. Oh, but haven't we all seen that famous picture of a black hole time and time again? Robbie Tye has done a careful analysis of that picture, which is from a small extract from a very large file of data with very little claim to validity. More than 99.9% .9 of the data was abandoned as noise, and only a tiny fraction remained as the signal to give that image. Other observers have failed to find such an object and concluded as Robbie Tai did, that they are artefacts. They come from inadequately controlled observations whose signal-to-noise ratio is too low to produce anything reliable. So as far as Robbie Tai is concerned, there's no evidence for the existence of black holes, and I have a lot more respect for his analysis than that of the Einsteinian. So how much credence can we give to theories like our universe is in the middle of a giant black hole? This implies that our universe exists within a black hole, which in turn exists within another universe. Or a white hole connected to a black hole by a quantum wormhole. Imagine a wormhole as a kind of tunnel connecting two separate worlds. In this case, one end would be inside a black hole called the parent's event horizon, while the other end would be outside a different black hole called the child's event horizon. When matter and energy fall into a black hole in one universe, they might come out as a white hole in another universe. Or that our universe is virtual reality programmed by superintelligent extraterrestrials. Based on the assumption that future civilizations will develop simulations that are indistinguishable from reality. Supporters of the simulation hypothesis often point to various indications that could be interpreted as evidence of our simulated existence. One such indication is the fine-tuning of physical constants in the universe. Or one of an infinite number of fantasies produced by mathematicians in as many dimensions as they choose, and based on any number of mathematical concepts coming from their own vivid imaginations. All of the proposed replacements for the Big Bang are just wild guesses, founded on speculation and abstract, assumption-riddled mathematics. 
they can't be anything else, since they have absolutely no evidence to stand on. Scientists should be listening to Leonhard Euler, who pointed out that scientists are subject to humiliating weaknesses and inconsistencies. He noted that a revelation, the Bible, was absolutely necessary to us, and we ought to avail ourselves of it with the most powerful veneration. Well, as far as the creation of the universe is concerned, the only observer was the Creator, whom Titus 1 verse 2 assures us cannot lie. We should take seriously what he said about the way he did it, instead of trying to guess. The creation account starts with the Spirit of God moving over a mass of water. On the second day he created the firmament of the heaven, in the middle of the water. It divided the water into two parts, the water above the firmament and the water below the firmament. He then stretched out the firmament of the heavens, putting in a great deal of energy. On the third day, he turned the waters below into the earth, leaving it pretty much as we know it now. On the fourth day, he created the heavenly bodies and set them in the firmament of the heaven between the earth and the waters above. We are not told how big the universe is, and in Jeremiah 31 verse 37, we are guaranteed that we'll never be able to measure it. But we can deduce what probably happens to starlight. From any bright object like a star, there'll be one beam of light which comes directly to the earth. The other light coming from that star will reach the waters above. The temperature of the waters above may be close to absolute zero, so it may be frozen solid. But whether it's liquid water or ice, we can expect that it will reflect light. All reflections lead to loss of energy. Frequency and amplitude will decrease. So there'll be redshift and dimming of the light and probably some distortion and reduction in clarity. Some of the reflected rays from our star will reach the Earth directly. Others may be reflected many times before reaching the Earth. We can be pretty confident that after two or three reflections, the light reaching the Earth would be so dim it would be impossible to see them. But with huge telescopes and advanced charge-coupled devices, it may be possible to detect many reflections. So when the James Webb's newly found galaxies look like things the astronomers have already seen many times, it shouldn't be surprising. They probably are things they've already seen many times. They're just a bit more redshifted and perhaps a bit more distorted after being reflected a few more times. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, Please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.